Big Hits WBTC, that's Paul Simon's 8.30 in time for our 8.30 high beam now. And today, it's Talk with the Doc being brought to you by Mako's Pharmacy located at 240 East 3rd Street in downtown Yorksville. Mako's Pharmacy is your local pharmacy with a caring and knowledgeable staff focused on your health and wellness. And of course, that means Dr. Timothy McKnight is here with us this morning. And uh, Doc, good morning. And I've kind of been baiting everybody saying, hey, uh, you know, you might have something and not know about it. So... Uh, you know, I don't want anybody having a panic attack. That's not what we were talking about, right? No, we just want to inform people. So. Okay, good. Yeah, that was that was my that was not your idea. That was my okay. idea. So, okay. Okay. So, uh, how are you? First of all, I'm doing great. Good. Thank you. And uh, it, everything's well over here. So uh, we thought about uh, this, and um, this is something that affects a lot of people. What we're going to talk about today, right? Yeah, it's a silent killer because people aren't aware of it. So absolutely. Uh, in fact, it affects 50% of American adults. So, you know, one out of two of the listeners are going to have this, and only about 50% of them have it under control, and that's hypertension, high blood pressure. Right, right. And like you said, silent killer. There aren't any real outward effects to think, oh, boy, I might have high blood pressure. I better go get that check, right? Well, for, it's amazing. Some people can have really high blood pressure and not feel it, and others are maybe 20, 30 points uh, above the ideal range, and they have symptoms, headache, fatigue, uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, some shortness of breath or chest pressure. But a lot of people don't know it, especially um, when it's moderately elevated. And it goes on for years. And every time that heart beats uh, and the pressure goes through the blood vessel at a higher pressure, it causes micro damage to the lining of the blood vessels, and it catches up with you. And in time, it can increase your risk for heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease. So those are the, the real concerns that we have when it's untreated. So the, f the first question is, how do you get this? And I know a lot of this is hereditary, right? Yes, it's hereditary. Um, it's also lifestyle. You know, uh, the wrong diet, too much salt in your diet, not enough exercise, uh, being overweight, all those things contribute to it. But a lot of people, a lot of us have normal blood pressure when we're younger. Uh, but by the time we're 50 or 60, that pressure is going up. And the doctor or the your provider is saying, hey, you've got high blood pressure. And what I hear is, oh, I've never had high blood pressure. I can't be right. Well, think of your blood pressure, uh, your blood vessels as an elastic uh, hose, a rubber hose that stretches um, with pressure. And over time, that if you had a rubber hose, it would get stiff and, mm -hmm. and kind of start to crack. It's almost the same thing happens with the blood vessels. So in time, when those blood vessels don't uh, dilate with that pressure, the blood squirting through, the pressure goes up, and now you have high blood pressure. So this often catches up with many of us later in life, in our 50s and 60s. And you said uh, so many people are, are affected by this. What are some of the treatments? I know people think, oh, you get a high blood pressure pill, but maybe there are ways to avoid the pill? Yeah, actually, yeah, there's some there's some great uh, preventive measures. Uh, course number one is to eat a healthy diet, uh, low sodium intake. Um, the recommended intake for sodium is 2,300 milligrams a day, but the American Heart Association says less than 1,500. That's the equivalent of a, a half a teaspoon of salt, is, and, and most of the salt we're not adding. It's in the food, right. so we don't want to be using a lot of salt in our food. Um, uh, ideal body weight exercise, uh, not smoking, um, those are probably the key ways to uh, prevent the blood pressure from staying out, becoming elevated. Uh, but then once it's uh, it's elevated, um, then we have to, well, first of all, we have to define what uh, elevation is. And, and the American Heart Association has changed their guidelines, and now the ideal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Not too many people have that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then we call 120 uh, to 129 over 80 to 85, we call that prehypertension, and we're kind of watching that. Clearly, if it's above 140 over 90, that's high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But then a few years ago, they said, well, if you're elderly, if you're in your 70s or 80s, we'll let it go up in the 140s. So this is kind of a moving target, but it's pretty clear that if you look at people that die, mortality data, the, there's not much change, not much risk when your blood pressure is 120 over 80. But by the time you get to 140 over 90, you start to see that risk go up. And then above 140 over 90, it really goes up. So we really do need to be treating that, but we have to diagnose it accurately. And I mentioned before we came on that I've made the mistake of seeing somebody in the office with white coat hypertension. They're, and I know people get nervous in the office and right. the blood pressure right. goes up. 
but I will treat somebody with a blood pressure of 160 over 90, and they're calling me, you know, a week later that they're they're almost passing out when they stand up. So I've over-treated something that was a false elevation in the office. So we recommend that you check your blood pressure in both arms several times. If you're concerned, get a blood pressure monitor and do it at home. Check it at home. Bring your monitor into your provider's office at your next appointment, and let's compare your pressures with what we get on our machines. Kind of calibrated, right? Exactly. So you kind of really have a, a true feeling of what's happening. And every now and then, I'm still not sure. So uh, many of us will have somebody, uh, our patients, wear a 24-hour blood pressure monitor that they get from the hospital, and it goes off every 30 minutes randomly, night and day. And we really get a good feel for what's happening with the blood pressure. So we got to make sure we diagnose it accurately. Right. Is this something that in your classes that you can address? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's really the whole purpose. That one of the reasons I designed the course was to help people become educated. Because too often, I think, in, in primary care, when somebody comes in with high blood pressure, the provider will say, well, this is easy. You need a pill. And that's kind of what we've been taught to do, a pill. And we do want to control it. But many of us don't take the time, don't feel we have the time to really educate patients. I mean, it's taken me seven or eight minutes to talk about some Mm -hmm. of this and to explain it in further detail and then show them the dietary uh, type of choices they need to make. That takes even more time. So we don't have that time. And so that's why the the, uh, Fit for Life program was developed to help people really understand what they need to do. So if I'm on the borderline or a little bit high, is there a, a good recommendation of things that I should do or maybe some uh, foods or some things I should stay away from? I know you mentioned uh, sodium, salt. So anything yeah, else? You know, um, the American Heart Association has, if you go to their website, they have recommendations. They recommend the DASH diet. The DASH diet is it's really a pretty clean diet, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, nuts and seeds. But it is, in my opinion, it's pretty flawed because they also recommend six to eight grain servings a day. In other words, you could have eight pieces of bread a day and still be within the recommendations of that diet, which to me, that's ludicrous. I mean, you cannot get, maintain your weight. Most of us can't on eight pieces of bread yeah, that's a day. That's a lot of carbs. That's a lot of carbs. So I, I think that's... Uh, I think that's somewhat flawed. So, you know, what I would say, uh, exercise is a great way to yeah. get your blood pressure down. And you can't exercise twice a week because it'll it'll start to creep up, you know, 24 or 48 hours after an exercise. So continue to do that five, six days a week if you can. Uh, that's, that's an excellent way. Don't smoke. I mean, smoking really puts those blood vessels at risk. Uh, Low-sodium diet's kind of interesting. It, it doesn't lower it that much, but that's what everybody tells you to do. That's the focus. Uh, moderate alcohol intake, you know. More than one beer a day is probably too much. Uh, more than five ounces of wine a day is too much for your blood pressure. So, How about hydration with water, though? That's good, right? Uh, yeah, that's really good because you want to be able to flush your kidneys, and that's how you get rid of excess sodium is, is through renal excretion, and, uh, and drinking a lot of water helps you with that. So uh, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do before we jump to medication. But it's interesting that the first class of medication that we recommend is a, is a water pill. And it's for the very thing you mentioned. It's that uh, too much sodium holds water in the blood vessels and raises the pressure. So we use a a low-dose diuretic to try to help control that. So that's uh, one of the first things we can do. But the other thing I wanted to mention is this is really about reducing your risk of heart attack and stroke. And the American Heart Association is is making these recommendations. So if you're a a pre-hypertension, you're sort of borderline, they will use a, a calculator. You go online, you look at this calculator, and the calculator says, are you a man or a woman? Are you, you know, what age are you? Do you what's your total cholesterol, your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol? Do you smoke? Um, and based on that, it'll, it'll spit out your risk. I did mine today. Mine is borderline. Mine's always been in the 130s over the 80s. My 10-year risk of a heart attack is 9%. Anything greater than 10% should be treated when it's borderline, Mm -hmm. okay? But when I look at that, that recommendation doesn't consider exercise. It doesn't consider uh, homocysteine levels, which I measure in the office. That can can really... uh, dip us to a genetic defect in the way uh, we metabolize a certain metabolite that can injure the blood vessels. It doesn't uh, uh, account for the fact that optimal testosterone levels in men and women both really reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke. And that's something that I've 
I've been on testosterone replacement for the last 10 years, and it's allowed me to be more physically active, and it's lowered my LDL cholesterol. So there's some benefits to that. So I think even those recommendations have some holes in it, but um, it's still a good reference to go to for the average person to see, you know, what should I be doing with these yeah. pressures and what are the lifestyle modifications I can make. The first thing to do is uh, make sure you're checking it fairly often though right absolutely and and don't overlook it don't deny the fact that oh it's never been a problem i don't have it because i'm telling you you don't want to have a blood pressure of 150 or 160 over 90 for 10 years it will catch up with you and when you're older you'll kick yourself because that stroke or that heart attack could have been prevented potentially and especially stroke i I tell people you know a lot of us are we know people that have had heart disease they have a stent they have open heart surgery and you'll look at them a year later and they look fine and they act fine but a stroke can you imagine the devastating consequence of a stroke where you can't talk or you can't move your arm or your leg um there is a, a, a devastating cr- stroke called locked-in syndrome where you are completely motionless. The only thing you can do is blink your eyes. Can you imagine being trapped in a body that is can't really even communicate? I mean, that is tragic. And I actually had a patient with that, and I asked him in the hospital how he was doing, how he felt about this. And he couldn't communicate. He, he could blink, but I didn't understand his language. But a tear rolled down his cheek. You know, a 65-year-old man going to spend the rest of his life like that. We don't want to see those things happen. Please make sure that you know what your blood pressure is and have it controlled. I don't think I can add anything to that. So yeah. thank you so much for well, coming in. Well, I hope in. it wasn't a downer. <laughs> uh, there's a positive because yeah, well, lifestyle changes make a huge difference, yeah, yeah. and I've seen it. My father-in-law had uh, was on two or three medications for his blood pressure. He was 40 pounds overweight, never exercised. He said, I'm going to start walking uh, an hour a day, and I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat right. Within a year's time, he lost 40 pounds. He's lit at, at the age of 60. He's running an hour a day, six days a week. No blood pressure issues, no cholesterol issues. So it can be done. And this is starting with walking. So it can yeah. be that simple. Yeah, be mentally strong, and then uh, it turns out well. It, it definitely does. And Dr. Tim, thanks a lot. You're welcome. That's uh, Dr. Timothy McKnight here today on our 830 High Beam Talk with the Doc. And this morning's Talk with the Doc has been brought to you by Mako's Pharmacy, offering their customers and community free assistance with comparing and selecting a plan based on your specific prescription needs. Call Mako's Pharmacy, 740-922-5400.